to Hope Talks. I'm Dr. Charles Montario Archer, President and CEO at One Hope United. Hope Talks are a conversation with industry experts and thought leaders on all issues pertaining to protecting children, strengthening families, and stabilizing communities. Today's guest is Mark Brewer, President and CEO of the Central Florida Foundation. And our theme for today will be the philanthropic redesign. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Charles. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Why don't you start with telling the audience a little bit about who you are, what is the focus at the foundation, and what draws you to this type of work? I appreciate that. So uh, the Central Florida Foundation is this region's community foundation. And there are community foundations in pretty much every community in America, almost 700 of them. And our role is really to be a center point in philanthropy. Our mission is to build community by building philanthropy. And that's really code for getting people in the community to think strategically about the way they give to the nonprofit sector. So you know that there's a retail side of the sector and then there's a, a more investor-like side of the sector. The retail side is all the fundraising that goes on. People do events, folks write checks. That's part of the democracy. But philanthropy is about people who make investments into the community through the nonprofits that they make gifts to. So people create charitable funds at the Central Florida Foundation. And then our foundation grant making team works with those grant makers to get to their dream, their hope, the things that they wanna see happen and make certain that we're driving positive social change in the process of doing that work. But I'm drawn to the work because I've been doing it for a long time and it, it really is what sustains me. Uh, you know, you can get up every morning and identify all the things that go wrong in the world. Uh, we tend to get up every morning and identify how we can fix one of those things. <laughs> and if you fix one, you can fix more. And I think if you can get to source problems, you can sometimes fix many things by solving a source problem or issue. And so that's kind of what keeps me going, especially during the pandemic, the knowledge that uh, great communities have great people who come together. And it's not just about giving, it's about bringing their intellectual strength, their hope, and their ability to help others get work done. And when you can be a coordinator, when you can be a servant leader in that space, uh, that's a wonderful thing to do for a living. So, so it definitely does sound like you are, you know, creating hope in the central region of uh, Florida. So, so, you know, in, in so many words, where exactly are you seeing this hope after a year of this pandemic? Well, you know, you and I talked recently, uh, I think a little bit about this. The, for the first time, literally in many of our lifetimes, uh, we have a canvas on which we can paint a new picture, right? It hasn't been since the late 1930s after the First World War and after the Great Depression when Americans got up and realized that their economy didn't really work well. They had a bunch of veterans back from a war that didn't have jobs and had nowhere to go. Their economy was not likely going to kind of rebound quickly, and they couldn't kind of see the end of that. And so America went to work distinguishing most of the institutions that we work with today. They found ways to solve problems. And I, I see it the same way. I think we're going to, over the next five to 10 years, we're going to have the same experience in America. So if we can think of this pandemic as a disruptor, which it is, it's disrupted everything, then there is now open room for innovation. There's room for people to try things they might never have tried before. There is no, uh, there are no bookends to keep you in your place. Uh, where advocates used to roam the countryside looking to advocate disruption so they could change things. Now you don't have to do that. It's already disrupted. So we can start changing things. So I, I would say to you that I hope we're creating hope, but the way we're doing it is using this disruption to the positive to say, okay, it doesn't work. It's not gonna ever be the way it was a year ago, February. So let's figure out how we can make this work differently. And most of the barriers and boundaries are gone. And the things that are troublesome, the ability to find enough money, to find enough resources, to find enough of the, you know, the right kinds of things you need to rebuild systems and institutions, 
Um, that's not a problem. That's a challenge. We just have to figure out how to do it. You, you, you talk a lot about the disruption of this pandemic and how disruption can really be the, 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 the launching pad for innovation. And I, I totally agree with you. But what strategies should nonprofits implement to prepare for the shifts that we see in reaction-based giving? Yeah, so there's really three things uh, that you can see in the data where nonprofits, if they're really paying attention, you would begin to think about these three areas. The first one is retail fundraising the way it used to be, all right? So it used to be that uh, many nonprofits didn't have diverse revenue streams. They got a lot of money from the public sector uh, through contract work, or they got a lot of money through events, or maybe they had a couple of grant uh, foundations making grants to them that they kind of sustained themselves on over time. The first thing is really to diversify the revenue streams as far as you can. So if you think for a minute of a continuum, where on this side of the continuum, you would have old retail fundraising, and on this side, you'd have thoughtful uh, givers who are actually making an investment in the outcomes you present, not the things you do. So back in that retail space, the problem with that is that we've trained donors to ask a lot of questions and make a determination about whether they want to give to the thing you're asking them for. Now we need to retrain donors to give because what you do creates a positive change in the community and not try to create a list of all the things that you do and decide which things they wanna to give to. Mm -hmm. And so the, the problem is, you know, if you and I were in the private sector and we needed money for our business, we'd sit down with an investor, tell them that we needed a million dollars to do the expansion we need and describe with a, with a pitch deck exactly what the outcome would look like and the investor would either make the investment or not. In our sector, we go out and ask for a million dollars and 20 people give us $1,000, 14 people give us $25, a couple of people give us $200,000, and then some people give us money only to feed the children on Tuesdays. Some people give us transportation money to get the kids to the program, but we can't spend it on overhead for gas for the busing, right? And, right. and so we end up with a million dollars too at the end, except we end up with a million dollars we can't spend to get to the outcome that we know we can so that's the first thing is to get out of that retail space, diversify the, re the, the revenue streams and get people to invest in what you do, not how you do it. The second thing, uh, many nonprofits are going to have to change their business models. I mean, we are the sector. If you think of human services and the arts and you think about education, these are all, uh, these are all business in, in which you do things face to face with people. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that we should move away from doing that when we can, but until we can get face-to-face -face with not just our donors, but with the very people we serve, we have to find new and creative ways to, to connect and convene. And so at the second level, it's about figuring out what's the new business model gonna look like and what could you do in this new world that you couldn't do before and then get to that transition. The third thing I think is really important is to be honest with you, just honesty, right? Uh, the nonprofit sector tends to, to hold on to permanence. They tend to, everyone in the sector tends to think, well, if we just wait this out, maybe it'll go away. Uh, there's a time when you look at your financials and you look at your mission and you ask yourself this question, is everything I'm doing getting me to that mission or am I doing some things that I'm doing because someone's giving me money to do it? And if I shut those things down, would I have more focus and concentration to do what I need to do? Once you get the answer to that question, then start shutting things down. <laughs> and, and if that makes you nervous, hibernate some things. Mm -hmm. What that means is don't shut them down, just turn them off for a while. And if after two months, when things straighten up a little bit, you look at it and you go, I don't know why we were ever doing that in the first place, then you can shut it down. If you find out that you can't get along without it, then you can bring it back. But I think those kinds of business-like thoughts and thinking of a business case for the work we do is complicated and difficult for people in mission environments. But those three things would make a big difference. Th those sound extremely, extremely powerful, which leads to my next question. Where is the hope that lies in data, that lies in theory or change, 
and social impact messaging? Yeah, so the very uh, act of innovation on top of disruption has to be driven by theory of change. So let me just start there for a minute because to get to the hope, you have to have a pathway. And your pathway should be your theory of change. If you think for a minute, in, in fact, even going back to what I said a minute ago about getting people to invest in your outcomes, what you actually get done, requires you to have something that people see as a value proposition. And it's not your strategic plan. Your strategic plan is a document that's linear in nature. But your theory of change shows people that you have a vision, you know how to get there, and your theory of change has to be validated, which means it needs to be either academically validated. There are papers that say, when you do this, this happens. It has to be model validated, which means you've been doing it for 10 years and every time you do this, this happens, that works. Or it's a model you borrowed from somebody and polished up and put into play in your community. When you've got a theory of change, that creates a value proposition and that creates hope for your investors, right? So if we know that the way we've done things for a long time isn't solving some of our complex social problems, then giving more money to the things that don't work don't create any hope, not, either, not for the investor and certainly not for the people doing the work. So my hope, and I think the hope that I see is that people are actually thinking through their theories of change. They're testing things. They're using data in new ways they haven't before. Uh, now I'm fond of saying that in philanthropy, investors have to have a head, a heart and a wallet. And you have to bring all three of those. Uh, this isn't the 1950s anymore. You don't get to just come volunteer some time and don't do anything else. You don't get to just give money to things because people tell you you should when you have no heart for them. And you also don't get to just love things and hope they get better without bringing your head and your wallet to the table. If you do all three of those, then those investors, those philanthropists, if you will, they want to see a theory of change. It brings them hope and something to invest in and it helps the organization really see the path to the hope that they're trying to create. So my last question today is, what gives you hope for current donors and future donors? Well, two things. One, I think you can have hope in an American democracy where during a pandemic, when things are terrible, giving may actually go up four and a half percent this year when we see the final numbers here in a few weeks, for, not this year, but for 2020. And it could go up as much as 5% for next year. So I have hope that Americans will come to the table with their wallets if we can provide them a value proposition and some hope to invest in. But I also have hope that we're gonna get to a new space in America where people who were not actively engaged in working on things will get there. I was at a wonderful breakfast this morning where almost the entire building community in Orlando, these are builders and contractors and developers, have gotten together with an organization that in essence recruits them to help them set up projects to build things for human services nonprofits. So if you think about all of the housing needs, you think about all of the workspace needs, the things that the, uh, the, the care uh, facility needs that people have, where you would typically go and uh, do some big capital campaign, mm -hmm. then you go to the market and, and pay for it, only to find out that you didn't have enough money, right? So what this group is doing is three times a year, they'll pick a huge project, bring all the contractors and materials together and build it, if not for free, then at least for a small amount of actual cash money as they can. This is the birth, now they've been around for a while, but this is the birth of a new kind of way for communities to think. Yeah, we need the wallets at the table, but we also need some of that old fashioned, I have resources, I have skill, I'm gonna come and help you because I recognize you can't do your job if you don't have the right facility to do it in. And if we have to wait to raise money and then hire contractors to do it, why wouldn't we just get the best people who know how to do it, design it and build it, and then that's our community's gift to you, which would be a wonderful uh, thing to see happen across human services, not just in construction, but also in volunteering. And I have hope that that's gonna happen because I see more and more of this kind of behavior 
coming out of the out of the fog where people are saying, hey, I, I don't know what to do, but I know I could do something. So you tell me what you need and I'll figure out how to get it done. And that may be the new kind of mix between volunteering and giving uh, that we weren't seeing a lot of before the pandemic. I'm really gl glad you talked about that because there is the, the component that, yes, we want the wallets, but we equally want the heart and talent that doesn't already have that capacity necessarily to make a monetary donation to an organization. So I'm really excited to hear more about that in the future, but it definitely really feels that from your perspective, that there is hope in this industry for us and, and people making contributions to the work. It is painful right now, Charles, as you know, lots of people in the sector are going through the, the pain of it, people dealing with the pandemic. Uh, we're having a, a, a racial justice reawakening in America right now, which is painful for everybody. But at the end of that pain, I see a much clearer sky and I see America doing what it does best. And that is finally acting to solve problems instead of constantly talking about them. I see more of that today than I did pre-pandemic. Well, that, that sounds great. And, and you know, to take a quote from what you said, we are coming out of the fog, but there is a moment that we just have to push through. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to be able to do that with you and the Central Florida Foundation. Um, so Mark, thank you for being here today. We're really glad to have you. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you more about this in the future. It's an honor, Charles. And let me thank you for all the great work that you do in the community. Uh, thank you. Um, so thank you for watching this episode of Hope Talks. The next Hope Talk will be soon, and we look forward to having you join us then. Follow us on all of our social media handles for updates about One Hope United and Hope Talks. Thank you for joining us.